the slave system hinges upon the idea that a black person is a thing, an object, a chattel. Now, how can you have uh, individual rights in a world that's dominated by the property status of, of the African slave? And what Equiano and others are doing is to argue that we've really got to move away from this idea that the African is a thing. He's clear, the African is homo sapiens. In 1783, the end of the American War of Independence brought large numbers of black slaves to these shores. Britain had promised freedom to those slaves who fought for the king, and many black soldiers sought that freedom on the streets of the capital. The sight of many sick and destitute black poor pricked the conscience of liberals who sought Equiano's help. Gentlemen, may I introduce Mr. Gustavus Vassa? There was then in the city a select committee of gentlemen for the black poor, to some of whom I had the honor of being known. And as soon as they heard of my arrival, they sent for me to the committee. I do think that he felt that now that he had arrived, now that he had a bit of wanderlust because he had to keep traveling in order to make money, that this was a place where he was allowed to make a difference. And once he realized that he had things that not others had, that he was in fact rather different from others because he had this freedom of movement, that he could accomplish things that others could not. He was a consummate networker, as we would call. You know, the kind of guy that uh, they say, here's my card. Um, who do you know? So I will know them. You know, he, his contribution was very valued by the abolitionists. Equiano wasn't alone. Large parts of the black community in London were also becoming politicized. They began to call themselves African reclaiming for themselves an identity that all black people shared before enslavement. The leading players of this reinvigorated community formed a new lobbying group called the Sons of Africa. The Sons of Africa are quite a mysterious group of characters. Their value is that they were the first black lobbying group. They were people pushing the interests of the black community in the public view also um, before Parliament and in that regard they are historic. It was very much because of people like Equiano and his friends that, that black people were at the forefront of trying to, to work with the abolitionist movement, to advise the white people on how to act, to write letters to the press, to write memos and memorials to famous people without compunction and say, you must help and stop this. And we have to really change that image of the poor slave being helped out of slavery by the, the well-meaning white person, because they really did work, not exactly hand in hand, but perhaps uh, room in room. Equiano's work amongst the black poor brought him into government circles, and his letters to the press enhanced his position as the black speaker for the abolitionists. In this enlightened age, it is scarcely credible that a man should be born or educated, in the British Dominion especially, possessed of minds so warped as yourself. Equiano, the English gentleman, had the literary and social skills to argue clearly and discredit the growing pro-slavery assertion that all Africans were illiterate subhumans. It is through such letters that Equiano became known beyond his tight-knit group of anti-slavery friends. What you're looking at is the emergence of a kind of modern society that's highly literate, that's national. People are able to read and write, and if they can't afford newspapers, they go to coffee houses, and they go to uh, taverns where you can read the newspapers. And that's the world the abolitionists make the most of. They use the world of print to promote the idea, am I not a man and a brother? And who was at the heart of that in the late 1780s? But Oloda Equiano. He was the most famous black man at the time. He made sure that he was most famous. He kept inundating the newspapers with letters, <laughs> um, telling them that he was there, that there was a black man there called Gustavus Vassa, you better look out for him. He engaged in the newspapers with an the anti-slavery debate. Uh, he picked fights with people so that that was all part of, you know, 
apart from his sense of natural justice, was all part of his PR, raising his profile in the press. The abolitionist movement was gathering momentum, and Equiano saw how he could harness his newfound preeminence to further the cause. He decided to write a book, and for the first time in print, he chose to use his African name, Alouda Equiano. Here is someone who has literally been around the globe, but more particularly someone who is very, very familiar with the Atlantic world, the black Atlantic world. He has had from birth experience of Africa and its societies. He has experience of the plantation societies in Barbados. He's familiar with uh, Virginia. He knows the black communities in uh, the British Isles, particularly in London. Here is someone who can draw on all of the collective experiences of these communities, synthesize it and make sense of it on the page. He can present it to a white majority audience in a way that's never happened before. This is his revolutionary act by simply writing about it. To get a book published at this time, it was usual to get a number of subscribers to sign up and pay in advance to fund the printing costs of the first edition. Equiano's list of subscribers begins with the Prince of Wales and lists members of the aristocracy, parliament, the churches and leading abolitionists. The book was a runaway success. It combines the zeitgeist of the abolition movement with an adventure story, a spiritual autobiography, a travel book. It was designed to appeal to the greatest number of readers and Equiano also knew that he had to make himself as appealing, as unthreatening as possible. At the front of the book is a portrait of Equiano, a black African in European dress, clutching a Bible. It's very important that he is a book, that he's dressed in a certain way, and that he doesn't dress in a way that represents something in an, under a, a palm tree, you know, or in a hut, or any of the ways that they imagined it. And you could not open that book and see that picture without thinking, ah, oh, but but he's an Englishman, <laughs> a different sort. <laughs> we haven't really encountered someone like him before, but he's not wearing someone else's livery. He's wearing his own hair, and he is in some ways becoming one of us. I believe there are a few events in my life which have not happened to many. I pray you, attend. It was almost a constant practice to commit violent depredations on the chastity of the female slaves. I have even known and gratified their brutal passion with females not even 10 years old. In his writing and on his book tour, Equiano confronted his white audience with the horrors of the slave trade. By becoming a British gentleman steeped in British culture, he proved himself to be one of them, a fellow human being. There was a great deal of um, desire for Exotica, reading Exotica. And then suddenly it turns up in front of you as a self-taught man with a kind of heroic character, well-groomed, civilized, articulate, eloquent. And he reads to you autobiographical details of great suffering, of being removed from his mum and dad. I mean, that gets you crying. For my sister and I were then separated while we lay clasped in each other's arms. He has an astuteness about him, a cunning, an ability to read you as a white person and to see where your weaknesses are. I think he put a very um, international and English face on the slave trade. I think he caused the readers great shame. O ye nominal Christians, might not an African ask you, learned you this from your God? who says unto you, do unto all men as you would men should do unto you. He pricks the conscience of the British. Here you are, you're extraordinarily prosperous on the backs of what? The sufferings of people like me. Uh, but at the same time, you regard yourself as a devout people. What kind of devotion is this? What kind of ethical Christian world do you live in? So 
Surely this traffic cannot be good, which spreads like a pestilence and taints what it touches, which violates the first natural right of mankind, equality and independency. But Equiano had studied the English since the age of 12. He knew them inside out. He knew that religious and moral arguments would cause a stir, but little more. He knew he would have to offer an alternative economic vision, something equally profitable in return for the lost revenues of the slave trade. He offered free trade with Africa. He was nearly 50 years ahead of his time. All of this taught him that particularly in dealings with white people, that money was something they understood, that money was a way to get to their heart, and that slavery was only useful to them in that it brought them a higher income, and that if he could propose a way that they would get the same amount of money without having to do terrible things to people, without dragging them from their homes, that this would give them an alternative. So he had an idea that trade established with Africa carefully and over a period of time would benefit Africans and would benefit Europeans. Commercial intercourse with Africa opens an exhaustible source of wealth to the manufacturing interests of Great Britain. The abolition of slavery, so diabolical, will give a most rapid extension of manufactures which is totally and diametrically opposite to what some interested people assert. He gets the British reader in a kind of pincer movement. He looks at the economics of their system, the morality of their worldview, and their religious sensibility. And what he does, he rounds the whole thing off by saying, you should bring this whole thing to an end. And you'd actually be better off economically, socially, and morally. End it, and you'd be better people, you'd be a better nation, you'd be a more prosperous nation. The abolition of slavery, in reality, is a universal good. Tortures, murders, and every other imaginable barbarity and iniquity is practiced on the poor slaves with impunity. I hope the slave trade will be abolished. I pray it may be an event at hand. Within three years of its publication, Equiano had completely transformed his financial situation. He accrued an estate of over 1,000 pounds, largely profits from the book. He was a wealthy man. He also had respectability. He got married to a white woman. I don't think he was making a statement at all. You know, most black men in Equiano's time in England married white women, and that was simply because there were very few black women brought over as servants. You found your mate where you could. I think the statement Equiano made was that, you know, he was in love and it was time to get married. He married Susanna Cullen in 1792, and they had two children together. But his happiness was interrupted when his fame and fortune provoked the inevitable backlash. If you're going to write a book criticizing the slave trade and saying it should end, and saying that the planters are monsters, uh, you can expect a very powerful lobby in London, i.e. the West India Committee, to take exception to it and to say rude things about you. The critics sought to undermine the book's impact by questioning the authenticity of the author's African roots they alleged he was actually born into slavery on an island in the West Indies. So he hadn't been captured as a boy. He couldn't have experienced the horrors of the Middle Passage. Equiano hit back immediately. Newspapers said he was born in some Danish island in the West Indies. What is your evidence, you know? Uh, so he's asserting his nativity, his belonging to a continent and, and to a people. Secondly, the sales of his book depend on him being an African, not a, not a West Indian, not a, a runaway uh, black person from the North American plantations, you know. It depended on him being an African, so the first person born in Africa to have ever written a book, you know. That's a selling point, so, it, so he's also defending his market. 
but the pro-slavery-sponsored attacks had hit on a possible Achilles heel. Recent research by Professor Vin Caretta has uncovered Equiano's baptism record and his naval papers, both of which record his birthplace not as Africa, but as America, South Carolina. When I looked up the record and saw that it says Gustavus Vassa, a black, born in Carolina, 12 years old, I thought, uh, well, he didn't necessarily have control over that information. Uh, his owners could have said, you know, put that down for whatever reason. But on the naval record, when he went on an Arctic expedition in 1773, and he was a volunteer, he was a freeman, and it's there that he's listed as being born in South Carolina. And that was the really problematic piece of evidence because he would have been the source for that. And so how do we account for that? I mean, documentary evidence is very annoying and says what we don't expect it to say. There have been conferences in which people were at each other's throats over this because it meant everything to them to say that he always told the truth, that he is the one person we've got and the one person we know enough about to say this about. He's the one black person of his time who was a man of the world um, and that if we take that away, then what have we got? Does the rest of the story fall into shreds? I hope not. I mean, I think you can you get into literary arguments about that early section, who, who influenced it, how it was written. Uh, but you, what you're not going to remove from him is this is quite extraordinary political and social uh, resonance that that book has. Even if you had a preface at the beginning saying, we're not so sure about chapter one. Those Equiano experts in Nigeria, America and Europe who believe that he was born in Africa are working tirelessly to try to prove it but it is unlikely that the truth will ever be satisfactorily established. What is certain is that the criticism he faced in his lifetime did his reputation and his book sales little damage. He died in 1797, a wealthy man, a gentleman. But he died without seeing his work bear fruit. It was another 10 years before the slave trade was finally abolished, before Britain and America declared what Equiano had known all his adult life, that the trade in human flesh was an abomination.